Hey, social media, Mike here with Charles. Charles, hey, what's up? What's up? And guys, today's special, special guest, our good friend, Logan, is going to share some knowledge with you guys. Isn't that right? That's right. Logan is going to drop some bombs, especially when it comes to dirty title. Logan is what to be considered a title expert uh, for someone just here earlier and say, hey, aren't you the title king? So that, that's kind of getting spread around. But today, guys, uh, Charles and I definitely want to sit down. We want to take what's in Logan's head and share with you guys who are watching because if you guys have title issues, you guys are definitely going to watch this episode. This podcast is going to be crazy for dirty titles and contract disputes. Stay tuned, guys. All right, guys, we're back. Man, Logan, it is our honor, man, our pleasure to have you here. How you Thank been? You. Good. Busy? Yeah, 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 for How sure. How you feeling, man? Good? I am. It's the end of the day. I'm a little slow, but I got it. Yeah. All right, man. Well, let's get to it, let's man. Let's get to it, man. So, man, we've gone back how long? A couple years now? Yep. It's been a few years, and we've done some deals, or we've, done, we've had some heavy discussions, I want to say that, when it comes to title issues. But before we get into the title issues, Logan, uh, let's just talk, let's start from the beginning. For the people who are watching, how did you get into real estate? What, what made you do? What were you doing before real estate? So I was in the oil field. Well, before I went to the oil field, so my mom was a realtor for a long. She did sales for uh, radio stations and went to realty. It's all sales. My dad was a CPA, so I had some background in finance. Um, and then the real estate, of course, I've been around it forever. So the real estate market, we got a little weak back there in 2007 and eight, mainly eight. Uh, my brother and I flipped a couple houses back in our hometown. We did pretty good, but we realized we didn't have enough capital. Where's the home? Yeah, Temple, nice. Central Texas. Temple? That's right. Nice. Up cool. the street. So, yeah, yeah. 60,000 people, not a big place. You know, we buy a $20,000 house, put fifteen in it, and make fifteen when you sell it. Not bad, but we realized we didn't have a lot of runway. Mm -hmm. And uh, so not too long after that, a buddy of mine called me from the oil field. And then you know what happens out there. You know, you work every single day of the week for three years, and they pay you a ton of money. So I left. So I went out there and saved a bunch of money is what it was. I just, I needed the cash and I knew that that was going to be an important component. So I went work out there for a while and I'd come into San Antonio on the weekends. What brought you to San Antonio? It was the closest big city. Mm -hmm. So I'd never been other than like field trips to the Alamo Dome when I was a kid. You know, not the Alamo Dome. <laughs> the Alamo. The Alamo yeah. yeah. Remember the Alamo? So down Laredo, Midland, and every about three weeks I get a couple of days off so I'd come here. And I'd seen Austin, the east side of Austin develop, and I mm -hmm. saw parts of Houston develop. In the past, so I'm driving around the east side, jogging, riding my bike. I'm like, man, this could be gold one day, maybe. Yeah. So that's I kind of started getting into that. Um, in the old and you were right. It was a little bit of risk. I took all the money yeah. out of my 401k and all the cash I had and started buying those little lots for a couple thousand bucks and the houses for the 10 grand or whatever. And I wish I would have done that. Dude. Looking back now, I'm like, I would have borrowed everything I could from everybody. Yeah, but everything. Man. You know. So I did that. And... Um, once the oil, we started to get a lot of market pricing pressure on the barrel of oil in 2015. Mm. And that was right about the time that my property values went from like this to about that. Mm. So I look, I didn't have quite as much cash at that point, but I had some real assets and uh, no debt. So at that point, I sold a couple properties that turned around pretty good. So now I got some cash, pay some bills for a while. I'm going to try to do some real estate deals. So, yeah. so that's what uh, Temple, Texas, you yep. said 08, we you in the oil field? When did we do the first real estate deal? What was the real estate? Was uh, I know a lot of people who are watching the show. A lot of it's a lot of wholesaling, but you weren't you didn't start off as wholesaling, did you? No, I bought some rent houses um, for a family member back in Temple when I was living there. So we did a couple of the flips. That was 2010 is when that was. The first deal was a rental, or the first the deal first was a flip? flips. You flip. know, How did that go? Flips. They went all right. I mean, it was kind of, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> That's how everyone starts That's off. That's how right? it starts, man. That's how it starts off. Just, just do it. Action, Take action. Man. Yeah. How'd you find that first deal? 
How did that? Actually, so one of them was my dad's old house. It was trashed. And he gave it to us. And then my mom was a realtor, so she found mm. a couple deals. And that was 10 years ago, so you could find fair deals on yeah. MLS. So that's where the first couple of them came from. They were small deals, but it was paint, lipstick on a pig type deal. And they were nice, clean little houses. And and when you when you decided to throw your hat here in San Antonio, what year was that? That was 2011 and 12. And if you look back to 2011 and 12 oh as to right now, oh is it night and day for you, like, like education-wise? Oh, dude. I, it's incredible. I would say each year, because of what we're doing every day, we're learning years and years and years worth of experience in every six months or nine month period. So when I started out doing the flipping, and just from there, I said, man, I gotta get better deals. So I started looking for my own deals, and I started finding these problems, because San Antonio is a super old city. Mm -hmm. That leaves title problems. And these things, I mean, these people would say, I don't want to give you this darn property back. You know, back then, the property wasn't worth much. So yeah. they said, they'd say, look, I'll give you this property for $3,000 if you pay off the 3000 in back taxes, because we're sick of mowing it. So I'm in a 10,000 square foot lot on the east side, right by the Alamo Brewery for five grand, six grand. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you know, that's what that started really looking like at that point. Yeah, we we uh we pride ourselves on on doing uh, clearing a lot of issues on title, but but I think you've taken stuff to a whole level yourself, you know, because you're doing a lot of, a lot of stuff that people don't do. So fair to say, I think I didn't really intend for that to happen, but what started to happen is the market started to be so competitive. If mm -hmm. you'll notice, we're in 2020 right now. So in 2017, it got to the point where 16 and 17, finding leads the same way you used to do, didn't happen anymore. You couldn't go get the, you couldn't print out the rex report list 21 days before the sale and, and go get knock deals? on doors and get pre-foreclosures anymore. Cause they're like, they tell you, man, 10 people have already come mm, by, seven yeah. called, already sold it. Yeah. Calls, letters. Everything. Text messages, <laughs> ringless voice mail. Telegrams, yeah. <laughs> smoke signals, right. they got it all. Everything, man. So at that point I looked back and said, these deals that have all the title problems with 15 owners and all these dead people and no one knows where they're at and judgments and liens, Everyone says five people tried to buy and no one can buy it. So, all right, let me try this. Well, it's, it's, it's a niche, man. I mean, yeah. we get into the weeds ourselves, man, but I, I like what you're doing because I know that you live in the weeds. Every day. So at this point, you're just down and dirty, just ground and pound. So I know Mike's going to talk to you about that in a little bit. but How, how about uh, Easy Home Buyers? Where are we at from Easy Home Buyers? How did that start to where you're at now with ARP? I know you just announced it yesterday, yeah. right? Yeah. So I wanted to share a little bit about that. What is that? Well, I wanted to, you want a name to say what you do. I think you guys have a, did an incredible job of saying home buying, home selling, realty investments. Literally, it's investing and brokering in the same shop, and your name is, it couldn't be any more clear. And we started being, buying houses, and it, we wanted to make it easy on people. You know what I'm telling you? You go to these people's houses, they'd say, man, I've been trying to sell this house four or five times, and I can't. And I realized we were offering a service that nobody could, but we looked just like the 20 other home buying uh -huh. companies out mm -hmm. there. And after doing that long enough, I started to realize in the last probably four years, I spent half my time either in court or on the phone with our attorneys or dealing with city managers or, I don't know, somebody in the county, municipality, something like that. And I just realized, man, we're not easy house buyer anymore, man. We are a resolution company that is solving super high level problems. Yeah. And it was just time to make a change. That's why we made the change too. I mean, we started out really promoting uh, a company that we still own and actually hold a lot of assets in called HPH's Properties. And then, I mean, the more we got into the weeds of figuring out issues for people, you know, title issues or, or just problems in general, we switched over to Home by Home Setting Solutions, which is our parent name, Home by Home Setting. And now it's just like, just HPHS, you know? Because it's just kind of like branding, you know? And, and yeah. people just know you about that. So tell me about the, the new name. So we realized, you know, I say we, I'll explain it maybe at some point, but um, I started out by myself. I got a partner in a company. And then Ryan came on. And after about a year of realizing that he was really good at this, he became a partner. And then Dave joined uh, about a year ago, and he was made a partner in January, so we actually have a partnership. Um, several owners now, there are four of us. Um, 
but the, we realized that that group, what we were doing is really finding the worst problems and telling people we're going to fix it. Some of them didn't even know the answer, but we knew at the very end of every road, some sort of judicial solution can fix everything. Yeah. So we just started promising people the world because we knew we could fix it, but some of them didn't know how. And that was the big message, whether it be companies that are in the dumps and you got two owners that are fighting and we can buy part of their inter- part of their interest in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, retirement plans from divorced people. Um, the real estate stuff, obviously. Um, orphan estates, defunct estates. You know, we're resolving assets and problems and we have a partnership. And I thought, like, dude, that sounds better. So it's four of you right now? That's right. That's pretty good. I mean, it's, it takes a lot. You know, <laughs> it takes a lot with just two. It takes a lot. Yeah. Trust, trust me, but with four guys, I mean, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, all our guys here—they don't work for, for us; they work with us. So it's really kind of like we have a collaboration of, of you know characters, attitudes, you know, emotions. You know, uh, everybody's different, so everybody's striving to one goal. Yep. But you guys have a collaboration of actual you know paper, and 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 uh, was it a big decision to? To bring all that together under one umbrella. You know, our business, it's strange to explain this. We, I feel like we have a really strong business in terms of volume and all the, the bandwidth we have. But our business is not stressful. We don't have deadlines on stuff. You know, we're only using our own cash. We're not using outside financing. So we don't have to answer to anybody. And we have a very low pressure situation. And uh, when my first partner and I built the first part of our company, it just worked, and I don't know how, but it literally just worked. We became friends, we worked so well together, we complimented each other, and we just naturally became partners. And then one day we're like, our books are a train wreck, we need to make this a real company so they have their own books instead of yeah. mine and yours. And we did that. And then when Ryan and I started doing some deals together, we never fought, man, we never argued. I respected his position, he respected mine. And eventually, I'm like, gosh, this makes so much sense. And the exact same for Dave. We're literally married. We talked about this earlier. Yeah, yeah, we did. I'm married to those dudes. And the way this company's running, it's going to be for the rest of our career, probably, unless something, you know, the coronavirus Drastic takes amazing. us all down. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're married. I know, right? Yeah. You know, we've met a couple of times. He's a good guy, man. Chill. Yeah. Solid dude. Great family guy. Has his stuff together. So, so what's the actual name of the company? Because I missed it. So, Asset Resolution Partners. It's now our brand. I like that. It's a little more bland. It's not quite as as flashy as some of the ones in the past. Um, but that's it says know, it all. Acid Resolution Partners. That's it. We got a bunch of partners. We resolve the heck out of this stuff, and we're not a real big flashy group. But we sit down and grind it out. And we always fix it. Always. Well, guys, that's a little bit about Logan, where he came from. So oil field, Temple. Yep. First deal was a flip. Yep. Uh, that was happened to be in Temple because his, his mom was a realtor. Yep. Um, and, of course, it was like you said, Dad's house was the first one. Mm-hmm. A couple of buying holds mm-hmm. and then explored to San Antonio because, obviously, San Antonio and Temple is such a different market. Uh, but Logan is ready to drop some bombs. So if you guys have questions, let's go ahead and start asking this question. There's already a couple of questions already. Um, if you guys don't know, Logan is really, really a good expert when it comes to title and title issues. So he's going to talk about two things today. One of them we'll probably spend a little more time on. Uh, we'll try to get to both uh, his contract disputes, and then we'll talk about title, dirty title issues. Now, when, when someone says contract disputes, what do, what do you mean by that? When, when we're going to say, hey, I want to talk to you about contract disputes, or this is, well, give me some examples, or if you guys have some questions, please uh, start asking away. But contract disputes. And I'll throw one on you in a minute. Yeah, okay. well, we're, yeah right. challenge you. Now, before you start talking, yeah, yeah. before he starts talking, you guys know we have this button called the hype button. And Logan, if you don't know what the hype button is, is every time you drop a golden nugget, that's going to help someone who's watching this podcast, whether they're from Texas or anywhere else, you get one of these noises. Who has the record or not? Oh, man. The record is kind of tied it's, between it's tight, um, Doncito and I would probably say Elijah. Elijah. Doncito and Elijah. Doncito and Elijah, and Elijah Rubin. Elijah Rubin's here on the last week's podcast yeah. with the Fire Damage King. But I heard that Logan is getting the name Title King. So the goal is to get as many of these as possible because we want to drop value to the to you guys. And before we go, I just want to I want you to tell everybody out there, man, coming from your background, you know, we have we all have backgrounds. Sure. If you apply yourself, man, honestly, can anybody do this, man? I will say anybody can, but there's a couple really, really important things. This stuff is slow. You've got to have the legal knowledge. You've got to have patience. You can't finance these things anyway. It's got to be cash. I'm not a rocket scientist. I fell out of yeah. college twice, well, once. They let me back in. I got suspended. I have a terrible academic record. So what you're saying but is 
maybe not title or maybe not you know stuff that takes a lot of time but can anybody jump to this business and if they want to do this yeah can they do it yeah it just takes a lot of time and you have to really be thorough yeah. so so for you guys out there that are just starting out if you're just jumping on this horse and you're popping a deal and you don't know <clears throat> where to go what to do of course you can always turn to mike and myself but i can tell you right now i know this man right here both Mike and I know this this gentleman right here, and we, we you know we, we we think highly of him. And uh, man, you. we would Likewise. endorse we would endorse you anytime, man. So. Well, I'll say I would say about a third of the transactions that I do are from a referral source. Whether it's um, you got probate attorneys or just real estate or attorneys that are not specifically in real estate. Mm -hmm. You got title companies, um, realtors that list a property to sell and can't get it sold. Wholesalers that have problems, and just sellers get referred in. And we handle a lot of different ways to pay a referral fee. Sometimes we partner with them. There are a million ways to skin that cat. And I'll say we're not greedy on it. So when somebody comes in and if it makes sense, we take it through. Well, we so there's a lot of people watching. So shout out to everyone who's watching. Before Logan gets started to drop down these hype bombs, I do want to do a few announcements real quick, guys. Uh, so on your screen, you should see um, our social media, guys. If you haven't done so yet, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. The association, if you haven't done so yet, join the Home Buy Home Selling Association where we've got tips, tricks, all kinds of good stuff. Visit TrumpTheHustle.com. We do have a Lunch and Learn coming up, guys. The Lunch and Learn is March 17th if you are local. It's going to be buying real estate with creative financing. Uh, come hang out with myself, Charles, the Home Buy Home Selling Solutions team, so we can chat more about creative financing. It is a free event. So let's get back to this podcast. And Logan, I'm ready to push this button until the batteries run out, man. So let's get started. Well, just, I got one right now for oh, you. Oh, you here we go. Right now. Just do he it. has <laughs> one. He has one. All right, go ahead. All right. So talking about contract disputes, I was talking to a really old, incredibly wealthy, very successful real estate guy. And I remember he told me, we we're talking about contracts and problems. And he said, I said, it's in the contract. That's the contract. That's the deal. And he said, a contract, that's where the negotiations start. And he started laughing. And I didn't understand what he meant. Mm -hmm. Five years later, I get it. I know that paper says this stuff right now. But when he said a contract, that's where the negotiation starts. I was baffled. Now I say, get it. Say that one more time. A contract is where the negotiation starts. First one of the night. A contract is where the negotiation starts. I, I see that. Yeah. So I, the crazy thing is, you sign it, I sign it. Yeah. We got a deal together. This is what we're gonna do. It doesn't take five minutes for someone to change their mind on something. I know it's on that piece of paper, but are you gonna do it exactly like you said? Am I gonna do it exactly like I said? I don't know. And if one of us doesn't. Now we're at the table talking. What are we going to do? How many of y'all's deals have had to be retraded? Lots. Mm -hmm. One term. If one term changes, you're retrading. Yeah. So do you use a regular uh, one to four contract or are you using a special contract? It depends. I've got uh, the one to four or the unimproved. I use that a lot when there's a realtor or a, an attorney involved. Uh, we have a one page that's basically an abstract of that that mm -hmm. cuts a bunch of the BS out. It's literally a one page deal. Cool. I use that pretty often. All right. So contract disputes in, in a quick 30 second nutshell or just even in brief, what do you mean by contract disputes? How can someone like when Logan says contract disputes, what exactly is he talking about? Well, words seem to be really clear, but if you don't write it, when you notice when an attorney writes something, mm -hmm. you write one sentence, but to say the same thing, he writes a oh, yeah. this yeah, long, <laughs> that paragraph, it's hard to read because they're mm -hmm. verbiage, but there's nothing ambiguous about it. But if you write it, seller shall vacate property upon, when getting paid. Well, what does that mean? At the fun, at the closing of the sale, when the title company wires a check, when you signed but he didn't? I don't know. There's a thousand ways to get it backwards. Mm -hmm. So sometimes translations are a problem, um, but a lot of times it's flat out. We make an agreement and somebody says, I don't like that agreement or something's changed. Oh, my gosh. I have a $30,000 lien against me, and that's going to come out of my sales price? I'm not selling you the property. What do you do when that takes place? Well, first thing I do is I talk to them. At the end of the day, every, humans are emotional. Yeah. And the majority of humans make their first decision on emotion. So I don't try to, to give the idea of what I want to do. And I'm usually not the person that delivers it. I'll have the title company or someone in my office or me, if, depending on if we're going through title. Most of our properties now we don't buy through title. But I just deliver the bad news. Hey, we finished our title abstract. We've got a problem. Now, did you buy a car in 2007 from Toyota? Yes, I did. Now, did you pay that off or did you have to give it back? I had to give it back. They repoed it because some bullshit they're mad, right? Okay, you know that there's probably a deficiency of judgment and they probably took you to court. Well, I never went. 
So I kind of like get them in there. I say, well, look, Toyota Motor Credit has a nineteen thousand dollar judgment against you, and that's in the land records, and that's going to obstruct. It's going to encumber your property. They're going to want that money before your title is clear. So I try to explain that to them. I don't tell them what I want to do. I don't tell them how we're going to solve it. But I say, you have a problem. I don't know the right answer right now, but I'm going to call you back in a couple of days and we'll talk about it. They freak. They're already freaking out. Seventeen thousand. They're yeah. freaking. Give them some time to think about it. Talk to their wife. Talk to their kids. Sleep on it. Go exercise the next day. Get some more rest. You call them a couple of days later, and now let's talk about the solution. So I never want to deliver all of it up front. Do you try to um, help them settle those issues? We we do that. We we'll work with them and try to settle those issues, get them removed. Do you do that or just? It depends. If a lot of times I'll go to someone and say, "Look, we can strip the majority of liens from homestead and taxes can be stripped if you're willing to spend the money and the time." But in these cases, you've got folks that have a foreclosure sale mm-hmm. coming. You've got two family members that are fighting. One of them is moving to California next week. They want their money. So there are all these issues, and you got to figure out, am I going to give you a discount? Am I going to get a partial discount? Because if we don't work through the process, I'm going to have to go bring my lawyer, or I'm going to have to deal with it. It's going to take me a bunch of time. What do you find when you usually tell someone, hey, man, I'm not letting you know this contract. I'm going to have to get my lawyer involved. You get a lot of pushback. You know, we used to, but I realize a large portion of our business is referral now, and I, and there's so much going on in the real estate market in San Antonio that I'm rarely the first person to talk to somebody anymore. Usually they've talked to two realtors, three wholesalers, a couple other investors, and maybe several lawyers or title companies. By the time they come to me, a lot of times they know about a lot of this stuff. So it's rare that I'm the one that actually has to deliver the news anymore, and I prefer that they've been through that several times. So when they come to me, I'm not telling them anything new. They're telling me all these problems that and I'm looking at a way to deal with them. So I'll give you a good, uh, let's just uh, go um, there. I'll give you a scenario, something that I'm sure a lot of people <clears throat> that are in this business deal with, and, and I'm sure you, I can tell you what we do, and then you can drop some nuggets here for some people that might be interested. So, for example, real, real world example. we got a deal right now. Um, it's like other ones that we've dealt with before in the past, and... and uh, the the heirs won't sign, right? Because there's another heir they found out about that they don't want it. To, they don't want that heir to get anything out of it. It's it's a common law wife. Um, now their personal problems and their man. Yeah, they they hate each other. Um, like for us, a lot of times if it's really that bad, I mean we've let people out of contracts before. But there's sometimes right. when you have a lot of invested in a deal, you're like, wait a minute. Money. Time and money, I can't let you out of this deal. So, right. so scenario here it is: got a deal, got one side of the family. They found out there was an estranged wife that they didn't know about. She's getting half now; they're getting thirds um, of a half, and they're like, it's stuck. They don't want to move forward. They're like, what do we sell it to someone else? I like nobody's going to close this deal right. because there's a cloud on title, and I'm not going to relinquish my rights to this contract. Now we're past the point, I keep this in mind, listen to what he's going to say, I'm giving him, I'm giving you one that you're going to dig deep and I'm sure you're going to give the right answers. We're past the point of the contract, you know. Past the point of no return. We're pre- you're pre- pregnant, you're having this baby. I'm having this baby, man. <laughs> Come on, man, you know I'm a little chubby. Hey. <laughs> so, so, so we're, t- you know, t- you know contracts at title, and they're like, well, we don't have a contract. I'm like, no, no, we're still in contract. Right. So, boom. Scenario, how would you how would you approach that? First thing I'd go back to the folks and say, I realize that y'all have had some bad blood in the family. I'm really sorry about that. Please don't hold me hostage for the bad stuff that's happened. I'm the a, a third party and I'd really like to get this resolved. I know y'all hate them, but please don't hold me hostage for that. You'd be surprised that actually works more times than you would think. The next thing is I know that she owns fifty percent and this one gets a third and that one gets a third and that one gets a third. But that doesn't mean that's how the money's got to be split. I mean, technically it is, but the deal is whatever you guys agree to. So sometimes I'll go back to the, maybe it's this half uh, the wife, you said, or ex-wife, and say, look, this is a big title mess. Are you willing to take this amount? And then maybe try to bring a bigger share of the other family members that have been paying the taxes, all those things. Now, another issue is who's been paying the taxes? Who's been maintaining it? Nobody. Oh, Okay. That's a nobody, man. You know, a lot of times you can settle that stuff, but I try to get folks in, yeah. meet with them face to face and talk. The next thing is, I'll say, okay, I know everybody's mad. Who does want to sell? You want to sell half? You want to sell a third? You want to sell a third or whatever, six to six to six, whatever it is? Okay, I'll buy a piece. 
and then sometimes it gets a little tough. But if, if you have one person that's holding everybody for ransom, or maybe two people holding four people for ransom, then uh, we'll buy those four shares, maybe four of the six shares, and I'll go pay all the taxes. And now you can't close this through title like this, but I'll pay all yeah. the taxes. So let's say there's ten grand owed in taxes, I'll buy those four shares at a little discount because I'm going to spend some money on it, go ahead and pay the tax, and I'll send a demand letter over to the other two heirs that says, we're tenants in common per the property code in Texas. I just paid off 100% of the taxes. However, I only owe 50% of that. The other 50% is yours. So I do need to get a payment by the end of next week. If not, I'm going to see you for it. So we let that go. Did you get that? Did you guys get that? I hope you got to speak a little louder. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so did you guys get that? So he gave two different scenarios. First, talk to the people. You have to do the right thing yeah. first. Yeah. Settle, negotiate. Negotiate. Exhaust. I'm on my knees with people. Like yeah. I tell people, no pride, no ego. I'm begging you yeah. to do the right thing. Please work with us. Let's get this. And he got awesome. my hands. He said, "No, he means this shit." So, <laughs> <laughs> so remember, man, negotiate. It doesn't matter what the title company says. It's what you can put on the table and get people to agree to. Now, if you have the means, if you don't, you need to call people like us, or especially Logan. Is man, start buying some shares. Like when we do that, yep. we like I we want us we want to do our very best to try to get the person who has possession of the property. Right. Because if we get possession, that's everything, right? You know, and, 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 and uh, you know, it makes things a little easier. in the scheme of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, did you hear the bomb that he dropped? Right up, let him know. Hey, we're tenants in common. That's right. And uh, I paid 100 percent of taxes, and I need my half, baby. Right. That's right. That's right. So, so before I go into the next, uh, the, the the bad part about it is, so what happens when? Uh, in your experience, when they're like, hey, I'm not paying nothing. Man, I've had all different ways. I've had every scenario. But at the end of the day, folks don't want to litigate. Unless they do this for a living, it's not what they want to do. It's expensive. It's scary. And you've got to have really good attorneys. Otherwise, it's tough. So, you know, I tell people up front, I'm here to resolve this problem. I got pretty far in. I'm pregnant at this point. We're going to have the baby. And I need you to help me resolve this. And I offer so many situations. You guys... I haven't come to the house in 10 years. Y'all don't pay the tax. You're not using it. I know you're still mad to the other person, <laughs> but I'm already in this deal, and I'm trying to help them get out of their bad situation by giving them some money that you've been holding them hostage for. You're really doing a bad thing to them, but now you're doing a bad thing to me. And I try to do this face-to-face. -face. I'll go to their place. I'll bring them to our office. <laughs> and when they can see you're a human and you really aren't out like to be a bad dude, then sometimes they really get involved and they work with you. Sometimes you, they tell you fuck off and they're that, out. How many I, times? I, I want to ask this question real quick. How effective <clears throat> is that work? When you're actually just straight to the point, hey, the whole hostage, the pitch you just gave between 0 and 100, or how many times out of 10 does that pitch work? You'd be surprised. I bet you the more it works more times than it doesn't. Hmm. But you have, here's a key. You can't be fast. When I was young in this real estate game, and I know you guys too, you're telling someone, I got the cash, I can close in seven days, I'm the best there is, blah, blah, blah. You're pushing them to sign right now. Can you sign right now? Please sign today. I don't do that. I don't ask for a signature today. I don't ask for their promise today. I just say, I want you to think about it, and I'm going to call you in a week. You got to be willing to walk away, man. They got to know. But they know you're in the game because you're an owner yes, now. They have to know that you're vested in there, and really it doesn't matter what they do or say because you are you're you got all the cards. <clears throat> right. So I like that. So let's take it to the next step. So When, that you, when you've had to file suit on someone. Yeah. So at that point... A lot of times, these folks don't want to get that deep, and I don't really want to either, but this is your only real equitable solution at this point, so you do that. A lot of times, they're either going to hire a lawyer, or a lot of times, they're not going to hire a lawyer. Sometimes, they will, and they're going to call you, and that's your first shot to settle. Look, I want to resolve this thing. Your client doesn't want to spend five or 10000 on a retainer and burn fifty grand in the next year just beating each other up, all of us to lose these legal fees. A lot of times, they're willing to play ball then. Then, the majority of those people that get to that point, the majority of them will settle then. Every once in a while, you get someone who's despondent, they're just angry and irritated, and they're out for spite, or they're crazy. There are a lot of odds, and that's when you have to go all the way down. So, did you hear that? <clears throat> <laughs> so, I find, I tell my guys this, that when you, that could happen at any point with any deal. Yeah. What you have to be real careful is that, and I, and I don't know if you'll agree with me on this, you have to be real careful that, that there's a fine line between, you know, explaining, I understand, yeah. pacifying. You can't cross that line because I've had clients just 
spaz out on you because they think you're they're so personal with you that they can just do that to you. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah, and I'll probably let folks. It's tough. We all have pride and ego. We're all adult males, you know, and we don't want anybody telling us what to do. But I let people run me over a lot of times. I don't really have to use, you know, the words to show the strength there. But I'll let them beat me up. I'll let them beat me up, and I'll plead with them, and I'll really try to work with them. And I want to. I don't really ever try to get aggressive at all up front. I just explain everything, and I also like to use the property code, the estates code, the tax code, the probate code. And I show them the laws. We have all the books in our office. I'll show them these rules. I'll show them case law. You know, we'll go on the internet and search stuff together. And I really try to educate them a ton. The last thing you want to do is bring the lawyers in because that's. I know it's a good idea because you want to feel like a, you know. You got it, but that's the last thing you want to do. I mean, you hear what he's saying? <clears throat> I mean, I know some guys, man, that, that will just straight that's up. That's the first thing. Yeah. They will tell the client, I'll, those guys are I'll so sue you. Shit, they're like this. Yeah. 90% of those guys, yeah. you know what? I'll tell you three cases right now, last year, that we got to that point. They said, I'm going to sue you. I said, fine. Called one of the law firms that we work with. Said, run a conflict, checked against this guy and his attorney, and we're getting ready to get served. He called me two weeks later. I never heard from you. I never heard from you. I'm like, your attorney said he was getting ready to sue us because he thought you were taking advantage of us. We got a conflict check back. We're ready to go. And he was like, oh, that's not how I wanted it to go. I said, your price just went from 20000 to 30000 I was like, oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah, it's so now <laughs> let's complete this full circle. Okay. You got a deal and, <clears throat> and uh, client's going ghost on you. You know, the contract's a title company. You know, 30, 60, 90 days have passed beyond the contract point. Yeah. Uh, that's one issue. They're, they're saying, well, I'm not, we're not in contract no more. You're saying, of course, we are. Uh, that's one question I want to ask you uh, so that you guys need to listen to this. The other one is um, they decide they're going to get into a contract with someone else. So two questions. Boom, yeah. boom. The man of the hour. Yeah. Oh, so the first question is they become despondent. Yeah, you, the, you, you're we're past 60, 90 days, and they're like, hey, man, we're not in contract. So here's the first thing that happens. The contract expired. Contract yes. expired, yeah. Well, you yeah. know what? There's Show me the expiration date on that contract, and they point to that paragraph that says the closing of the sale shall be on or before this day. That is not an expiration date. That is a material term of that contract. You didn't perform that term of the contract, so now you need to go down there to paragraph 15. That's default. Now we're in the default contract. That contract is alive as well. It didn't vanish. Did you guys hear that? If you don't know your contracts, I mean, this is this is why we brought this yeah, man yeah. here, man. Is, it, is <laughs> that paragraph 15 default? Is that next to the mediation default, whatever? Yeah. Is that in your one-page deal? Yes. It is? It is. Yeah. <laughs> I reserve the right for specific performance for always. So if you don't have that right in there, it's it's a different deal, but... So the first thing is you got the ability to take the earnest money for liquidated mm-hmm. damages, but if you're the purchaser, it's, that yeah. doesn't do anything for right. your earnest money. So um, at that point, yeah, you got. So I explain that to folks too, but it, sometimes they go completely despondent, and so if that happens, will you follow a memorandum on that? So I will not. What I'll do is, if that closing date's coming and you <coughs> show up, I'm going to go get a cashier's check from the bank, and I'm going to go to the title company on that day. Now I know they're not coming because mm. they've been. They ghosted me, but I'm going to go to the title company and say, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Escrow officer, here's my cashier's check. Contract says the contract, the closing should be on before this day. So I'm here today with my cashier's check. I'd like my deed. And they say, well, the seller, I haven't heard from him in forever. Can you please call and ask him to come today? They call him. They usually answer. I ain't coming. Click. So I have this form that the escrow agent signs. It says, Logan Fulmer of so-and-so company um, attempted to close, brought his money, basically firm terms. She signs it, takes a copy of the cashier's check. I leave her copy. I get a copy and I go back home. I perform. A lot of times folks say, well, you said you weren't going to close, so I didn't go. But I was ready, so I performed. You didn't perform, dude. What do you do with that document? You have to perform. Depends where this goes. Mm. That's good evidence for court. And we've done specific performance cases before. And that was a very, very important thing. The performance was very important. But it goes back in the file. And then I reach out to the person to let them know, look, at this point, this is in a bad spot. I perform, you have it. I hope you're not in a contract with somebody else. Um, in that case, I'll probably file a memo. Or Liz Pendants, if we go in and file a lawsuit, that's a little stronger than memo. Well, yeah. so what happens, so I like that. You guys <clears throat> catch that? <clears throat> so that's very important. Do you mind repeating that for them? So you file the memo or the Liz <clears throat> Pendants, they didn't perform. Yep. When you go balls out and just, hey man, I'm going for specific performance. 
At this point, I filed the memo. Most title companies won't close around them. Some will, some yeah. won't. At that point, I'll call one. I'll try to stop by their house. I mean, I really go over where I send them nice text messages. I'll write them a letter. It sounds like you really, really go out of your way, man. I don't want it to get there, but if it gets there, you know, that's kind of we we do that. So I found the writing letter, which is an old school form of communication. We send emails, we send text messages, we do calls, all that stuff. We write really good letters. We apologize to them for any of the bad blood. We explain the situation. We ask and beg sometimes for them to come back to the table. We put a copy of the, the, the uh, documents that we, we attempted to close. Um, and we ask for them to call us within a couple days or maybe a week or two. If they would like to call our attorney and get some questions answered, we'd we'll be happy to pay for an hour or two of that time. But I mean, we really go every, we go all the way. Man, I, I've, I've, you, I've known very few people that just don't even go halfway. You go. Yeah. I mean, you're really going. You're really rolling out the red carpet, man. I want to give somebody. It's like your kids. You give your kids every chance they possibly can to get it right, and then when they don't, you're like, great, I got to thank you. <laughs> You don't want to do that. You got to spank them. So that's what happened. Yeah. So let's get back to the court in a second. But let's just say now they didn't close. They said they they ghosting you, and then you find out that they one have a contract with someone else, or God forbid, they close the deal with someone else. Usually that could happen. I'll get sometimes when it gets to that point, we'll get that memo out there. Um, I've never had someone else close it, but. If we get to that point where we're sending them letters, a lot of times those folks tell the other person, look, I've got this guy sending me attorney letters. We get calls from those other people. Yeah. That's the one I was telling you about, uh, the one in Austin where the guy was telling us he got some sellers to sign and we had some. And he was interfering with our contract and he knew it, but he ended up calling us because he realized it was a mistake. Well, that's good. I like, I like, <clears throat> I like that, that format because by you doing what, you, what you're doing, it puts – them on a hot seat and if somebody else comes they feel compelled to let them know like hey man I got this other guy and so what that does for you it it lets you communicate by way of them to another party that's maybe trying to get in there yep so at that point if we don't get anything there then we at this point we built all the evidence we have tons of emails we got tons of letters we got tons of correspondence we've got the document from the title company we have everything. So at that point, we turn we do a turnover file to the attorneys, um, and it's basically got a timeline. It's got our narrative. And it's got mm-hmm. Exhibit A, B, C, D. So it's an entire like turnover package. Did you guys hear that? So your process. Dan, I'm hot on your trail with the <laughs> yeah, with the nuggets. This is awesome, man. You need to know this stuff, man. So the process itself becomes the <clears throat> case, right? It man, is. that is so beautiful, man. The, so, the, your patience. That's one of the problems why a lot of attorneys have a hard time litigating. Is they don't because it's all of our time. They right. call and they yeah. explain all this. What happened again? I don't yeah. want to explain it. I want evidence, dude. What yeah. happened? How we can prove this? So your your patience, your due diligence, <clears throat> your documentation. Okay. It's all. <clears throat> it all can serve a purpose immediately, okay. or it all can serve as a means to an end. Yeah, it helps educate the folks. It helps keep them engaged. It really helps give them all the opportunities. And then when it goes wrong, this is what you're using to get there. That's awesome. Let's ask a, a quick question real quick. Uh, so Jason, Jason's a good buddy of ours, says he has a property with a $50,000 lien from an attorney. <clears throat> the seller said he'll sell it at 35000 What can he do to remove the lien? Depends on what the lien is for. Mm-hmm. An attorney filed a lien. I see those what happen with bail bond liens. An mm-hmm. attorney will provide a service for somebody. And the service was actually paid for, but the lien wasn't released sometimes. So I was about this close to suing a local criminal attorney because he did services, performed services for a gal that owned a, pro- a lot on the east side. He butchered the thing. He's not a real estate attorney for darn sure. He recorded a deed of trust and then listed Bear County as a trustee, which was a total screw up. But he, he did the case, finished it up. Then he deeded the property to, had her deed the property to him. When the case was over, he deeded it back to her. So he had all these messed up title instruments. Um, so anyway, I ended up buying the property, and he he had a responsibility to her to fix what he did wrong. But when I bought it, I sent a letter to him and said, I'd like you to release this stuff and do some affidavits for me. And he didn't respond. So my next response to him was, this is a slander of title at this point. So now I'd like you to help me resolve this, or we're going to sue you for slander of title. And at that point, his attention came back. And Mike, did you guys hear that? <laughs>
I mean, this is stuff people yeah. don't know, you know? People don't know, yeah. Well, I mean, people don't know. And, and let me ask you a question. I know you deal with attorneys all the time, so have I, trust me. I've had some that call me and <laughs> talk, talk some serious, like, talk serious, man. And needless to say, I've had a couple of them write me a <clears throat> apology letter because uh, I wouldn't move forward unless they would. So do you find that some attorneys sometimes, not real estate attorneys, but do you find that some attorneys sometimes, because they are attorneys, they challenge? Yeah. The, pro- the yeah, They had a lot of experience going to school. You know, They've learned all the stuff that a lot of folks can't do. They've got a special job. They spend a ton of money getting that degree, and they practice in a very specialized field, and 99.95% of the people in the United States don't understand it, and they're intimidated by it. So they realize they're special, and they get away with Not all of them, the very small percentage of them, but they get away with a lot of stuff for pushing people around, and they shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've had a lady one time, man, that... She called me just every name in the book, man. Really? An attorney. And I was like, am I talking to an attorney or somebody from, you know... She's hoping to just bully you around, dude. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah. So, so I was like, I tell you what, when your client gets foreclosed, you let her know that that uh, by her not signing off on this deal, she got foreclosed because of you. And when she gets that judgment, maybe you can help her pay it off. <laughs> so the very next day, the, the, the client called me, hey, can we sign? I said, nope. Nope, no ma'am, she was please. I said, nope, you have your attorney call me, and not only does she, does she need to apologize to me, I wanted her to put it on her letterhead that she's authorizing you, she's telling you, advising, advising you to sign on this deal, and for the reasons that, 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 that we know. And uh, yeah, man, about two hours later, hi, Charles, how are you? Good for her. Yeah. That was hard for a proud Negro to do, but she did the right thing. Good she did her. the right thing, man, but... But you can't be intimidated, man. If you know what you're doing, yeah. and if you don't know what you're doing, call this guy, you know. <laughs> but you can't be intimidated because it will happen. When I, the, the, the thing is when folks don't know what's going on, they get scared. Attorney says, We're, they're going to sue you for $200,000 of the damage, and all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, my God, my household's going to go bankrupt. Yeah. Dude, lawsuits like that take forever. It's much harder to establish damages than people really can think, or measure them than you really can think. And then you got to win the darn thing, and the other person has to pay for all that to happen. Dude. It's such a very small percentage of that that actually does happen. It's a bunch of talk. So, before I ask him something, I know I'm doing a lot of talking because this is a real special episode for me because we love title, man. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so I'm excited talking to you. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you have any other questions I want to ask? Uh, a lot of people watching, nothing but uh, Golden Nuggets, Fire, Sherry's on here. Shout out to Sherry. Jocelyn's on here, sure. Bryson, Gold Nuggets, Gold Nuggets. This is value. So, a lot of good compliments. So, thanks for everyone for watching. Uh, but no, go ahead, go ahead. Man, I've seen you recently, or maybe you've done it more than one time, but I've seen you recently uh, uh, take on properties that were landlocked. Yep. And I'm like, who the... Why would you do that? Who the hell would do that? <laughs> and and then build roads. Yeah, yeah. Talk about that, man. So Where he's going... They don't need roads. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> you hear that? Uh, break it down. You know what they say? If you build it, they will come. If they yeah. build it, they will come. For those who are watching, explain landlock real quick. Because we've got some beginners, then we got some uh, seasoned experts like Daniel Moore on here. And some, but landlock, break it down to individuals. So you're supposed to have acts ingress and egress to property in Texas. Ingress. See, that's how you know he's, that's ingress. How you know he's real. Now, if you don't know... Ingress look, look and egress. That that's that's yeah, that's real title words right there. Most yeah. people say what that means is drive in, drive out. That's what it yeah. means. But the title version is what yeah, he said. Yeah. So that's how you know he's a real deal. Most people are like hey, you're supposed to have a way in and out. Yeah. So that's so, how you know he's a real deal, so guys. Technically, in Texas, it's strange. It's it's not. It's only legal to sell property in a way that you have ingress and egress. So, kind of by default, it makes it illegal to landlock property. Mm-hmm. But let's say mom and daddy own a bunch of this land, and they let cousin build a house back there, mm-hmm. brother build one over mm-hmm. here, and they all let him drive down that side. But they maybe they cut it up into some pieces. Well, when cut when Mama dies and sells the front parcel, somebody else buys it. That road is not really an easement. It's just a little pathway that they put a fence on and made it look like a road. It's not a real road. Everything is great when Mama's alive, cousins alive, mm-hmm. and all that. But as soon as somebody changes their mind or dies or leaves, all hell breaks loose sometimes. Mm-hmm. So there are a couple different ways that you can deal with it, but. What we found is the research is the first thing. So I'll give you an example. There's a lot. There's so much you can go into this one, but there's a property out in Conroe. The guy called us last year and said this property's landlocked. And I said, okay, tell me about it. It's been landlocked forever. Mama owned it. It's been landlocked forever. We've never been on the property other than to walk across somebody else's land. So oh my gosh. By the way, I'm done paying my tax on it. Seven grand. Okay. 
So he tells me the address, I look at it, and I'm like, how much you want for it? He tells me a price. So I offer less because property that's landlocked, there's no real way to compare it. There's no real comps. So you don't, you can't do that. So what you have to do is you have to build up a budget. What do I think it's worth if it's usable? Then subtract some legal fees. Now subtract some construction costs. Now subtract some risk costs. And now all of a sudden you're down to this value. Oh, slow much. down, man. Please. Yeah, yeah. Can you <laughs> slow down, man? Yeah. Mike, come on, man. I'm trying to let him finish. Can I don't want to just, just drop it drop it. Yeah, but then they can't hear him. It's like a, it's like a fire hose. It's like, a fire it's hose. like you know, like the leprechaun just dropping just... Okay, go ahead, man. I'm sorry, so man. I, I have to take care of this, man. You, you know, go ahead, man. So, you again? So, 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 you have to build in a budget. Basically. You have to build in a budget. And, and at the end of the day, you're speculating because you don't really know totally. So I wrote a contract with this guy. We spent a bunch of time abstracting, researching, researching, researching. And I'll tell you up front about half the land in Texas that you think is landlocked ain't. But just because the CAD viewer that you're going and clicking on doesn't show a road, doesn't mean it isn't there. Doesn't mean an easement's not there. So we spent, Ryan, actually not we, me, Ryan spent about two weeks. So the way the property went is you go across four parcels and then the road stops. There's a county road barrier and then it goes to our, our subject parcel. So we're trying to figure out how to do this. So I said, all right, Ryan, you need to go find all the owners to all of those adjoining properties right now. Now you need to run a title search back to back, grantor to grantee for about 50 years, maybe 100. Because if anybody granted an easement, it's going to be one of those people. Mm -hmm. So he ran about a 100-year title search backwards to all the adjoining properties. And then once you get all those grantor and grantees' names, you've got to run an exhaustive title search through each of those in the land records to see if anyone was a grantor on an easement. An easement, yeah. So it's several weeks of that. He ended up finding an easement that was poorly indexed. The name was spelled wrong even, so it was like 10 times worse. He ended up finding that from the 60s. There was a partition of a large family track cut into four pieces, mm -hmm. and in that partition deed, it had an easement. Mm. So we grabbed that, yeah. sent it over to title, told the guy, I think we'd already, no, we hadn't closed at this point, told him we want some time, sent it over to title, sent the surveyors back out, because the surveyors surveyed it and didn't have a road. Mm -hmm. We sent that easement to the surveyors, they went into the meets and bounds, and included that in our survey and in our title policy. We rarely buy with title, but we found our answer early, so we said, let's just go ahead and get it. What the heck? So we had an easement, it was insured, and a boundary survey, and we bought it. And then the next thing is, I hadn't built a road before, so I didn't think it was that expensive. Uh, <laughs> to build a county spec road, it's expensive. And then to have a storm that happens once every five years, wipe half that road mm. out in two weeks, have to rebuild the damn thing, mm. that means we spent $35,000 for a 500-foot county spec road. How long was it? 500 foot. 500 foot. Yes. Now, there's some very low elevations, so we had to put some drain pipes in there. We had to yeah. get some good drainage. We had to build that road up. Some places, probably four or five foot. So it was a lot more material than a normal road. How large was the piece of, uh, piece of land? It was six and a half acres. Six and a half acres. Was it just raw land? Yeah. It was unimproved. Everything around it had been approved. It was a huge subdivision on the other side. There were homesteads all around it. And the neighbor, so where this easement was, the neighbor owned the tract across the street and this one. So they've been running their horses through mm. there. So when we show up with all these paperwork, they were pissed, dude. Super mad. So they were explaining to us, that's where I run my million dollar racehorse. You're not gonna let that racehorse out of there? And I said, you're on notice. The fence is coming down in a couple of days. If you let my million dollar racehorse out, we're gonna sue you. I said, you let your million dollar racehorse out in the wild, it's your problem, not mine. Okay. What were the uh, numbers for that deal? Because you spent, th I mean, some of you spent 35,000 on the the road, yeah, it's for a reason, right? So we we looked at the land and uh, they were getting ready to give the thing away. They were gonna let it go to the tax sale. They didn't care. And I said, look, we'll give you ten thousand bucks. At the end of the day, ten thousand isn't no money. It was not a lot for that property, um, but we didn't know where we were gonna do all this. So we did that. Um, so ten thousand for the seller. Ten thousand. How much of the taxes? Am I asking? We paid the tax on top of that. That was seven. Oh. for like, oh, that's seventeen. Yeah, that and the survey and title fees like and all 20. that. Okay. And then the road? The road's like 35. So we're all in 55. And the magic number? Well, the realtor said 200. So I'm like, all right, good deal. We list it. That didn't work. Got an offer. Somebody offered us 150 or 155. And they were thinking, no way we're going to take it. And I'm not greedy. I'm not trying to get, I'm not trying to squeeze every, yeah. you know, all the nip, or all the blood out of the turn up right there. I don't care. I still want to give him a $50,000 discount. I'm doing great. This guy gets a good deal. I could care less. We all go home happy. So. 
You're fixing to get inundated, man. All the land like Yeah, so Texas. this dude, <laughs> I mean, just, just to be clear. We just did another one. I saw that post, I think, yeah. Two weeks ago, we got we bought 15 properties a year ago, and one of them was up in Navarro County, up in North Texas, and we're or not a little east of Dallas, and we're looking at this thing like, dude, what do we do with this landlock? We're going to donate it to a land bank, and they're going to give us a tax credit for the deal or a, a charitable donation receipt. And I'm like, you know what? Man, let's just get rid of it. Forget it. There were 10,000 owed taxes on it. Ryan comes in the office one morning. And he's like, look what I got. Like, what is it? And he's like, guess. I'm like, what is it? He's like, guess. Try me to guess for 10 minutes. I had no clue. It was a uh, partition plat filed by a judge in a lawsuit from like 30 years ago. And that was our easement right awesome. down there. So that land went from being worth about 10,000 to about 80. Do you, like do you find that most of the... Most of the research you guys do, you can do it online? Man, in the big counties, yes. Like, Bear County has an incredible search. Our records go back to the 1700s in Bear County. That's awesome. You get to the smaller counties, and they stopped uh, imaging their land records, sometimes in the 60s or 70s, and you got to go to the county. you got to sit out there like a landman with all the other oil and gas landmen and dig through the books. Mm. So Dave, last week, dude, he was in two different counties. He did put a 1,500 miles on on the truck driving to Cherokee County and uh, I can't remember the other one, but he's out there in the out there in the land records. Like the 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 yeah, so mm -hmm. we've also learned some other stuff. Like in Chicago in the early 1900s, a huge fire burned down the courthouse. Yeah. That's before they indexed the land records. So vital statistics data before Chicago 1900s, dude, they're very hard to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't really exist a lot. <sighs> you fixing you fixing title up there too, man? A, uh, an orphan estate here had a despondent owner that no one could find. It turned out he was murdered in Chicago. Oh. And we were able to find his children. So we needed them. Mm. Yeah. Well, you guys are really understanding the value that's coming out of this. I know it's, it's, it's real technical stuff. A landlocked it deal that... It's it's so oh, technical, it's, right? Yeah, for some reason it, it could excited, be. Man. But for those who are technical, <laughs> a landlocked deal, most wholesalers... Even to include probably most investors that actually buy, we'll pass them on. This guy bought it, put thirty grand into it, and made six figures on a landlock deal. We we kind of bypass wholesalers uh, because you don't wholesale, right? I think maybe you done maybe one Very or two. Though, yeah, right? it just weirdly happened. The flips? You do a lot of flips? Not so much anymore. We've pretty much gotten, we're paper pushers is what it is. Yeah. Paper pushers and we're in the courthouse. Between those two things, that's all we're doing. Man, that's 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 a very, um, that's a very interesting niche, man. I mean, we like to think that we push paper, but you're you doing it at a whole other level, you know what I'm saying? That's It's really unique and, and shit, we admire that, to be honest with you. you know? Thanks. What else you got? Don't you have big deals in Floresville and East Texas? And what, what else you got going on? In the last... Probably a year, we picked up 80 acres in West Texas, 150 in Floresville. Um, Purchase see. those? We got 65, yep. We got 65 acres in, east of Waco, about an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, we got another 16 acres. Uh, well, what's what's the intent with all these acres? acres? Man, they have problems. A lot of them are minerals. Mm -hmm. Some of them producing, some of them aren't. And despondent orphan estates again. The same so, deal. when you're... Um, like on these type of deals, are you reaching out to these individuals? People are reaching out to you. And third question is, are you coming up with your valuations to uh, make these offers? You know, you know it's tough. Um, a lot of times, I don't make the offer out of the bay, out of the gate. So a lot, of, I'd say, a large portion of the stuff gets referred to us by other folks. We do look at tax uh, tax lists because at the end of the day, there are a million ways to skin a cat on a lead list. If if there's a big tax debt, that's the most sure sign of problem. Now. We don't stack lists, we don't filter them a lot, but we look for tax debt and we look for multiple owners. You got that two combination and you can count on there being something going on. Can we get them? So a lot of times we do our list a little differently. We look, if there's some tax delinquency and multiple owners, mm -hmm. we know it has this kind of problem on it. See that right there. See, that's the type of stuff, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people sometimes will ask me stuff and, and we start getting into the weeds and, I could tell they get bored by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's the type of stuff. What he just said only comes from experience. Yeah. And if you're not picking up on that, and, and thank you for sharing that stuff with, with everybody, you know, of course, you know. Because, you know, a lot of people want it, but nobody will do it. You know what I'm saying? 
But uh, that's the type yeah. of stuff that comes with experience, you know, and, and uh, so awesome, awesome. Um, go ahead. I was gonna say something, but go ahead. Talk to us about that 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 big one that you got, man. Which one? You know what I'm talking about, man. The historical one. Hold on, which the one? Office? The office? Yeah. Oh, dude. Tell us a little bit about that. The that story. Was a foreclosure. <laughs> Who owned it? All that stuff, man. So you went straight to the bank, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're not talking about money wise. We're talking about no. He went. He walked into the bank and said, "Hey." I would like to buy this building. I like huge, it. Huge gamble. It was. Tell us a story about it, who owned it, who built it. So when you're talking about valuations, it's really hard to decide what the value is on an outlying property. You go look at a subdivision in Stone Oak, there are 40 houses that sold in the last four mm -hmm. months, and they're all within a few hundred square feet of each other. Boom, you know your value, right? But when you're looking at an almost 6,000 square foot building in a historic district that's right by the Pearl, and all the other houses are 1,500 to 2,000 square foot, you're more than double all of them. It's hard to value. It is. But, you know, we're looking at the delinquency list, right? So foreclosure list a couple years ago. And I've been looking for an office downtown, but I hadn't found what we really wanted yet. Um, and this had a, let's see, they were in foreclosure, so I called the guy. I did a little research on the guy. The guy had been wealthy. He had a really big contracting company. And something went wrong in his life. Don't know what, but a mortgage loan had been taken out about four years prior, or three years prior, something like that. And I thought something's up. So I don't want to tell this guy I know about the foreclosure. I didn't want him to turn into a pride and an ego problem like it usually is. So I just say, hey man, I'm driving by this big old yellow building. Doesn't look like anybody's there. You're thinking about selling it? I might be interested. Just simple. No mention of the foreclosure, right? No, not at all. I, I don't want to put them off the right, on right. guard. So I just said that. And he goes, well, matter of fact, I am. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking, damn right, you better be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell him, hey man, meet me over there. Let's go look at it. So. This guy's 60 years old. He'd been an accomplished businessman a long time. I'm some to him a kid driving right. up, driving up my beat up Ford Expedition. He's looking at me like, really? So I walked the building with him. I talked to him. He said, you think you can take this thing on? I said, yep, I want it. So I make him an offer that was about 50 grand over what his uh, original principal balance was on his mortgage. So I knew he'd walk with about 50. And he said, you know, I got an architect offer that's about 150 above yours. They want the building. I said, dude, I'm going to be honest with you. That's a great deal. If you can get that thing closed, I think you should take their offer. You probably don't need my offer. Because at the end of the day, I couldn't match it. And it, I knew he couldn't get that done in like two weeks. So I said, dude, you should take that. If it doesn't happen, call me. So I waited about a week, called him. No, I'm still talking to him. A couple days before the sale, he stopped answering my calls. But I'd already walked the building. I'd seen what it looked like. So I went to the sale credit bid takes it back to the lender no one came up with nearly 500 grand four hundred ninety thousand dollars in cash to buy a sight unseen six foot metal gate around it locked no one's gotten into that house no one opened up the window to look so i called the bank immediately after that and said hey you guys are the owners struck off basically of this property i'd like to make you an offer i'm like no 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 that went to the foreclosure sale and i said yeah you haven't talked to your trustee yet you're getting it back and i'm like oh crap how'd you look up the uh the lender uh, that was on the deed of trust. The deed of trust. Yeah. Deed of trust, and then you just what? So the bank was. If you don't mind me asking, who was the bank? Right. It was Ozona. What is it? It was Ozona. So if oh. this were like Wells Fargo or right, Chase, yeah. I wouldn't have called them Ozona, Texas Bank. I would Google the vice president's name, call him. So you just went straight to the vice president? Yeah, but I also I brought um, one of my partner's father, who was a retired Wall Street banker, mm. really old guy. He was, he could talk the talk, but he was old. I, I didn't think I could walk in there and probably get the respect that I would need from a bunch of these guys. So I brought him with me. Makes sense. So we went in there, talked. They ended up taking my offer. So I basically paid all the debt that the guy had on it. It was right around 500 So I told him, look, I need a month. So I went and did some good inspections to make sure nothing was off. And that's in great shape, dude. I mean, we spent some serious money on the I've outside. Seen I've seen so you've done a lot of work. To who, who built that property initially? So Colonel Charles Gibbs was... Um, he was in the war, and then he was a southern general uh, land commissioner for the one of the southern railroads before the railroads were consolidated. So he, apparently the word is he ran a million acres in the southern part of the United States for the railroads. He built the Gibbs Hotel, which was at the time the tallest hotel. In the I remember that, yeah. Uh -huh. So that was the homestead. What are we talking about? How old? When was it built? 1884. 1884, man. <laughs> So 1884. Apparently, he's about to fall down in the late 90s. There was really? a 12 plex, murders, all this stuff in there. And the guy that had it before me bought it, and his business was restoring municipal, uh, historic municipalities like uh, courthouse, like our courthouse. You know how that thing was? Mm -hmm. He's a contractor to do that. Mm. So he redid this whole thing like incredibly. Yeah, we've been in that. We, yeah. We've been there and. Uh, 
You got a nice basement? I was about to ask you, what you do? What'd you, do? What'd you, do? What'd you end up doing with that basement? Uh, it's storage. It's storage. Yeah, so um, we're going to make it a whiskey cellar, even though I lost my uh, privileges to drink 10 years ago. And life's gotten so much better. Yeah. Um, all the partners in the office like it, and we're invested in uh, a whiskey company here. Mm. So we want to make it a whiskey lounge. I thought you were going to make it into a man cave. I guess mm -hmm. you got outvoted, right? Well, they want to make it something kind of like, I'm still calling it a man cave. They're calling it a whiskey cellar or something. Same thing. Yeah. It sounds more professional whiskey. <laughs> yeah. uh, man, I know we kind of skipped in the beginning, Andy, because uh, believe it or not, man, it's already been more than an hour. Oh, my gosh. Yes. What uh, what highlights do you have on this? Because uh, he has gems on top of gems uh, to drop to you guys. Uh, Hernando's on here. I, wanna, I saw this question. I want to ask this question. So, Hernando from Hilco, because you do a lot with bacon lots, right? I know we talked a couple times with bacon lots. He's saying that he saw a Denver Height lot. For seventy nine, but for some reason it sold for one hundred and sixty. Is it, am I reading that question? You see that question on there? Oh, dude, that's wrong. I believe. I think he's talking about one on Olive Street. You talking about on Olive, Olive Street, Street, dude? Hernando, ask that question. Oh, there he is. He's still commenting. So, Hernando, ask well, about Olive Street. I think that's a mistake in the land records because mm. I bought that property. That was one of the early properties that I bought, mm -hmm. and I sold it to a guy. That one and the one next to it, I sold it to him like several years ago mm -hmm. and then he relisted on MLS for 79 grand mm -hmm. but the closing price was 160 so what it happened is he ended up selling the house next the property land next to it with it mm. and the realtor just put both of them uh -huh. in the sales price mm. or it sold for 60,000 and she fat fingered a one in there by mistake 60,000 that, yeah, that that's not the going right really. all right that's all I was mad I was like, man tell me about that there's one how'd you do that right yeah. there's always an explanation well, everyone's watching Ryan's on here now so right. shout to Ryan so Norma right. Uh, Harper, Ryan, what's up, man? Ryan Harper as well. So shout out to Ryan Harper. So what do we got? Because we're, yeah. we're already about a minute, uh, hour and ten to this yeah, thing, and I really want to oh, give you guys what this dude has. I mean, how does crazy does this sound? Where if you can clear title issues, you can clear big deals like that six figure check and all types of crazy stuff that he's doing. What what knowledge bombs do we have left on this thing? You know, some of the bigger issues is the orphaned estates and missing heirs. That's one of the bigger issues. San Antonio is a super old city, and Folks don't get along, man. You guys, you know, have made it work as partners, but if y'all were brothers, y'all might not get along so well. If there were 12 of y'all, mm. you can count on a couple of y'all not getting along. Being an old city, folks don't get along, and a lot of folks around here didn't do wills, didn't do estates, so you guys have seen it. Always You've got seen. layers of airship problems, generations. Generations, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's something we've really taken to also because our research and our ability to find people has gotten so good. Um, but we've also learned to start being smart about it. So we'll hire an attorney for certain parts of it. But we've got a, a property in the gallon. Her mom didn't do a probate. Her, I think it was her grandmother that didn't do a probate. It was her, her grandmother's intent that she gets the house. She took care of her. This girl lived in the house for 30 years, been paying the taxes, taking care of it. And at this point, she's ready to get out of there. Well, they're like six or seven owners. And three of them own 0.83%, so 1% each. We met two of the brothers, and they said, man, this guy lives in Peru. He is in trouble with the law. He's a bad guy. He's run off. No one's heard from him in years. And I never trust all these stories because I don't know. Yeah. And I'm thinking, is he a bad guy? Maybe he's not a bad guy. But we got to find this dude to figure it out. So we started, we found, did a little research, and we found he sold his house and left uh, Houston, I don't know, several years ago. So we send up, we find who he thinks is his wife on Facebook, send her a message. She doesn't respond. So I said, all right, well, we're not going to dig around anymore. We don't have good resources in Peru. So we find a in private investigator in Peru, pay him a six or $800 retainer, and he goes, digs around, and says, this is their house. I said, okay, good. Now your next assignment is go knock on their door and tell them to call us. Said, what? Yeah. So he does surveillance, finally gets the gal, talks to her. She says, I got that message from those people on Facebook. And that's how we knew he talked to her because we didn't tell him we sent that message. Yeah. And we don't trust this dude. Peru's known for some serious mm. fraud. Yeah. He calls us back and says, we know she got the message from y'all, but didn't know who you were, so she didn't call you. I said, okay, good. He's doing his job. So now that we knew the message was right, we started sending, we drafted a really long explanation letter with exhibits, evidence, this huge fact sheet from our attorney where she delineated the airship with the laws, sent that to his wife. He emailed us a couple days ago. Now we're playing ball. But that took two months, a private investigator in Peru, one of the guys that works at our bank, he was born in Peru. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how to write the damn address right. So we had to call him. He had to help us style the address to get letters out there. Man, that's... And that was for 0.83%. Yeah. We could do a partition sale and dump it. Who cares about 1%? But we realized 
we can spend four months doing that, or we can spend two months and find this dude. Yeah. Hey! That's man. That's that's. Uh, <laughs> this is technical for sure. That's some serious yeah. work right there, man. You got You got to know what you're doing to do this, man. At the end of the day, you got to look at it because sometimes you know folks call me and say, "Hey, I have this problem. I bet you can fix it." And I look at it and say, "I can," but the problem is it doesn't make sense economically. Mm. And this takes a lot of resources and it time. Does. And I'm some of these are fast. We get them done in a couple of months. I guess I'm only thinking two, three years. So you can't count on them all being quick. At the end of the day, no matter what the problem is, there's some form of litigation that can solve it. They can exit you out of that property. They can monetize your position or can cure the title defects. There is always that. But generally, it's the last thing you want to do. That's our backstop. If all this fails, go to court. Man, that's awesome. We've had some issues too, man, with people we found in <clears throat> They were uh, serving uh, the military in Afghanistan. We've had to deal with them over there. Oh, wow. Mexico, uh, we, Mexico's a big one that we have to deal with. Right? The, 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 Nobody the, trusted in notaries over there, so notary down there. Is the craziest over there. one we did in Mexico. This, this is serious. <laughs> we, we called we called a uh, a notary. notary. It was an Eagle Pass, uh-huh. and we said we'll pay you. We're going to pay you good. Oh, American notary, go over there. No, she she wouldn't cross. So so. Anyway, she got a hold of the border patrol on both sides, right? Border patrol. Yes, border patrol. we had we had to we had to uh, get him uh, um, someone to bring him from some small town about a hundred miles up to Eagle Pass. So she they, she walked up to the right in the middle. They got we got border patrol on one side and border patrol on the other side, right? Mexican. He walks up, she walks up, and and she hands over the paper paper like that, on a, you know, on something to write on. He signs on this side of the border. She gets it back. Wow. She's there. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Hey. He, he couldn't come over, you know? Yeah. Yep, he couldn't right. come over. And so they did it right down the border, man. Just, wow. Here you and go. So, so in here in the United States, title won't insure Mexican notaries. They won't. Yeah. So you got to use the American, American notary. Yeah. yeah. He didn't, want, to the, uh, he, didn't to, he didn't want to go to the embassy or the consulate. A lot of times it's too far away. Yeah. Yeah. Too far. Or, they're, or they're not supposed to be yeah. going into the consulate because yeah. they're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, man. <laughs> well, that's some crazy stuff. That's cool. That's if, cool. If you ever, but that notary them. really helped us so out. So you guys right? had Border Patrol on this. I've never had no. Border Patrol no, or she, Homeland Security. She knew because she's from down there. She goes, I know the Border Patrol. I get this done. So we're like, okay, we'll pay. What do you want? You know, we paid her well. At the end of the day, you have to. These folks are doing something that no one else will do, and you need to take care of them. Yeah, she, she she came through, man, and and she got it done right down the border. Wow! Um, shout out to everyone who's watching. That's Albert's cool. on here. Anthony's on here. Shout out to Anthony, Jason, Jocelyn. Uh, they're saying that uh, Logan is the title whisperer, title king, title, title whisperer, whisper, title issue. Got a title uh, now, man. We've been on here, man, for an hour and twelve minutes. I do want to start wrapping up, so I do want you to drop a few more bombs. Cool. Let's get a few more questions. When you have this gentleman here with the wealth of knowledge of title issues, how he clears. Lots of crazy title issues. I know we referred a couple to you. We did, a, I think we did a deal once or twice on title issues. What's the most error have you seen? How many errors on one title, on We've one been property? Upwards of thirty. Thirty. And in that case, we had to do some judicial resolution there. Um, a lot of times, you can do an administration of an estate. So sometimes you can do the affidavit of airships, but the mm-hmm. problem is if you do that, you have to get everyone to sign. Right. Mm-hmm. So if one person, if all that fans out from one person, you can do the uh, administration. An administration of the estate. It's like a probate without a will, basically, and it's slow and a pain because the judge appoints an ad litem attorney to represent the unknown heirs. You got to get all these facts. It's really slow, but the linchpin is that one administrator, one signature can sign that whole thing. Okay, and done. Man, you see, a no, uh, this normal people, man, would hear you say this, and they'd be like, "What?" Uh, yeah, you know, uh, or, or they're like, "Man, that's, that's I, I don't care about that." But, man, what you just said was serious, man. You don't have to get 30. That house was down in the Lone Star District. Incredible deal. I bought it three years ago. Mm. Instead of getting 30 people to sign that darn thing, and some of them we couldn't find, the administration went out of there. So how about the individuals that own airship? How do they get their <clears> funds? So it depends. That stuff goes back. Depending on if the administrator can get a hold of those folks, he has got the, he or she has a responsibility to distribute those funds. Mm. If they're not able to res- distribute some of them, they're going to be put in the court registry. That's how you're supposed to be. When you start that, do you get your attorney <clears throat> to open that up with the court? Yeah, it depends on how it works. If I buy a share, then I can go in maybe as a creditor or as someone who's vested. kind of depends on how you're in it. Sometimes if it's really bad and we really need that person to stay because the judge doesn't want to appoint me, an administrator, right, or somebody else in the state, I'll just say, look, we have a deal together. I'm going to go ahead and hire the attorney to do all this work for you, and it's a contingency deal to me. If the whole thing falls apart, I lose all the money I spent. If we get it done, you resolve this, you get to sell it. 
But what's the cost of them like that? Average. You know, simple, clean, clean easy ones are five to ten grand. Some mm. nasty ones could take twenty grand. Mm. So they do have to make sense at the end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the day, a lot of folks don't understand. They don't believe in it, and it's strange. A lot of folks don't like attorneys because they bill hourly and they get sick of these bills right, for a fifteen-minute yeah. call. But that's the only way they can bill because there's no way to know. So folks don't want to do that, and we're willing to do that. We've done a lot of. Uh, we've done quite a few. Uh, probates where we pay for the probate and stuff mm-hmm. yeah and uh we've never done it's an administrative funds, one yeah. you know but uh man it's slower and the, what i dislike about if it's an independent administration once you get post or once you do or don't post bond you get the letters of testamentary and the administrator or the executor can sign on anything and do any transaction they want when it's dependent you have to bring a motion or an application to the judge to do everything to buy well, real estate to contract real estate to sell the real estate to distribute funds it's a train <laughs> What type of title do you get with it? Huh? What type of title do you get? So that's another thing. Oh, God, I'm glad That's an important that question. Up. I mean, I, I could bring it Dude, a lot of folks a say, we went to court. I got good title. Uh-uh. You might have good title from that person, but if there's a defect in the chain before then, or maybe one of those people that died in there, mm-hmm. you might vest them. But they're dead, and there are four other kids. Yeah. I need an affidavit of airship for them, and you might have to do some other curative title work. So a lot of folks, we don't run these through title because we're able right, to... Right abstract yourself but you have to get a title report on that thing and coordinate that administration with title company otherwise you get a surprise at the end sometimes so you get a special and then you work your way through a general you know i'll take any of them at the end of the day it's a warranty deed to get a title policy or you know it's clear it doesn't mm. matter uh so we're in the san antonio market so this is a san antonio question what real estate attorney do you recommend here in san antonio to do these crazy type of transactions and I'll be honest with you, I don't like to refer. And the reason is we I tried to find good attorneys for years, and it took me a long time. They don't want to deal with some little deal. But at this point, we've got five of them on retainer. Each one's kind of got a specialty in what they do, and we're paying monthly fees, and it's kind of a, an operation. So they're willing to take us on as a client. But a lot of guys call and say, I've got this title problem. They don't want to fiddle around with this one tiny deal that you're probably going to back up. Ten real, real, or ten real estate guys call uh our lawyer and guess how many of them actually do the case one mm-hmm. they don't want to waste their time so I, unless i know some like if you guys call me and said hey this is not exact problem in your referral and you didn't already have right. one i'd refer to you guys because i know it's gonna hurt i can't yes. i was about to ask you man because i know i'm on your roll of dicks right that's right so we got we got some good attorneys ourselves but i'm real always real shy uh to refer the yeah, ones course. that do real yeah. specialized real specialized right. stuff because they get inundated with a bunch of BS, mm-hmm. man. Uh, next question. That's right. <clears throat> next question is, how often do you read the Texas Real Estate Code regulations from Osvaldo? Dude, I have that stuff on my desk. The Estates Code, the Probate Code, the Tax Code, and the Property Code. Those are the four codified laws in Texas that really generally affect real estate. I have those and also have the uh, title underwriting standards from several <laughs> title companies. <laughs> She's a, go, every single day. She's a what up a title company, man. Yeah. Thought about that? You know you can't, right? <laughs> you know you can't, right? <laughs> Yeah, you might as well do it. Sure. Right? Think into that. I like our job. I like our yeah. job. Yeah. I mean, it's I kind, it's kind of title. Yeah, you know, this guy's gonna open up a title company one day. We should discuss something <laughs> along those lines. Uh, next question, kind of broad, but what's the best way to remove a lien from a home? I know it'd be. What you know, type it of lien is, is if it? it's a homestead, mm-hmm. a large portion of the liens can be stripped from homestead. You pay attorney several thousand bucks and you send some letters to the creditor and say, "Please release this lien." That works a lot in Texas. Um, you can strip a lot of those. Like that. Now, another thing a lot of folks don't realize is they get this title commitment, and the title company put all 30 of those liens on mm-hmm. there. Just go look at them, pull them up in the county records. If they're over 10 years old mm-hmm. and they haven't been refiled, you can go back to telling them and say, These, 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 these are over 10 years old, and they'll yank those off. So Mike and I, we've gotten deals like that. We get all this stuff. And you're like, This is all clean. Yeah. And like, well, we did one, had, I don't know, man, had a lot. Like, 43. Over, almost, how many? 43. 43. Oh, my so, God. So Michael took half, mm-hmm. and I took half. There was nine errors. <laughs> there was. Yeah. And within three hours, we were able to put together, you know, marriage, you know, marriage, marriage licenses, licenses, divorce Business trees, entities, birthdays. Driver's license. Driver's license. license uh, DBAs. And we figured out cause for every Prior single person. deeds on where they used to live. Yeah, we put packets together. Mm-hmm. We sent it back, and then clear, 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 clear. Because you got you got to... You, you know, you got to paint the picture for them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We, we're able to show for every single person this cannot be the guy. People think title companies' job is to do all that crap. They're not. They're yeah. escrow services and yeah. they're insurance companies. They're not lawyers. They're not curative title work. They help sometimes, but people yeah. get pissed when they won't do that. And I'm like, dude, that's not their job. They're not going to do it, man. If you don't know how to do Especially it. Especially if the contract's for 20 grand. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> Here's yeah. another thing that a lot of people miss. 
go look at the abstract of judgment. So many attorneys are lazy. They don't put the last three digits of the driver's license or social security mm-hmm. number on there or their damn address. They put their name and they file it. Can't prove that's them. Title company bar it. Boom. Out. So just a little. As, man, can we get another you know, title company would, in your opinion? Yeah. Would they have the, the seller at least do an affidavit identity? Yeah, a lot of times they'll yeah. have them do that. Depending on who. So if you guys didn't catch that, rewind this, this podcast. So what we've done in some cases is. Man, I'll just tell the attorney, look, because the attorneys don't, they ain't going to make up stuff. But I'll tell the attorney, look, this is what I'm going to do. Now I need you to tell them what I'm going to do. Right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sue them because I feel they filed this incorrectly. Well, Charles, I can't just tell them that. No, 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 I'm telling you that's what I'm going to do. So just send it. Let and them you, know. And you know. from a title company. Let them know. And you know what? They get it. And in most cases, they'll respond and be like, man, just release it. Right. Because they don't want to come to court, man. That's simple. Let's get these questions knocked out the way. Yep. So next question right, is, else? how long does it take for the judge to approve a dependent estate sale and sell price? Uh, man, again, that depends. I mean, if it's a dependent administration and the judge doesn't feel like it's a fair price, he's gonna, he can has the right to order an appraisal. Mm-hmm. He's got a right to request all heirs to sign off on it if he doesn't think it's right. Um, you never know, man. I mean, it, those dependent administrations... A lot of folks will say, oh, they'll take 60 days. That's bullshit. I've never seen one take 60 days, even an easy one. I count six months at the low mm. the low side and a year at the high side to get it done. All right, scenario here from Bryson. Bryson says, I have a property right now we have under contract with a seller who's independent administration. Yeah. The judge accepted our offer, and will there be any issues when we try and go to wholesale? Because oh. now we see when you wholesale it, there's going to be an assignment. I don't know if the judge has to see the HUD. Dude. They're going to see an assignment fee. But we've, so, we've wholesale property before. But with the uh, dependent if, judge on that, like what he does. The administra- if the administrator applies and gets approval to sell the property, the judge is not going to see all that documentation. The administrator can go and sign the contract and sell it, and the administrator has to provide, uh, what do you call it, an accounting and an inventory of the mm-hmm. estate back to the court record. Right. So at the end of the day, he may not see all that. Now, you might run into problems with your timeline on your, on it, but at the end of the day, if your spread's good, just take the thing down so you don't have to deal with all yeah. that. Or if you got some questions, maybe call me. I'll take it down with you. Yeah. Or okay. you could always do the, the good route, too. The good route, Bryson, is just to double close it. Yeah, if you yeah. double close it, it would take care of all that good stuff, too. Uh, Jason, thank you, of course. Uh, Jason, another question. An attorney placed a $50,000 lien on the home because of a car accident where the person never showed up in court. That's a default judgment. Depends on how long ago that was. Um, sometimes you can file a bill, hire an attorney, file a bill of review for the case. Let's take a look at this thing. Was it filed right? Did the attorney make any mistakes? Now he might be wanting to settle that thing. It might have been a total mistake. Mm-hmm. But the first thing is you're going to need to call an attorney and have him reach out to that person, to that other attorney first. Man, Sorry. for you guys that are listening, I mean, do you know how many people, I mean, I'm sure, like, well, with all your knowledge that you have, we get inundated ourselves, but with all the knowledge you have, People here, man, really need to take advantage of listening to this podcast again because all the knowledge you've, you've acquired over a long period of time, yeah. and he's just right here, man, just giving it to you guys. Great, man. I'll, this is how I learned this. Before I started actually doing the deals, I had these nasty deals I couldn't get closed. They can just big, long schedule, see like you're talking about, and I didn't know what any of this shit meant. Abstract of judgment, who's that? So they'd say, you know what? There's a real estate attorney down the street. I'll never forget John Lowe's, the first real estate Hello? attorney I went to. Yeah. Yep. Independence title referred me over there. Yeah. I went over to his office and he's like, I don't know if I can fix any of this stuff. I said, Well, can I just pay you for by hourly? And I sat down in his office and we started going over it and he'd explain each one of them. And I said, Well, what if you do this? He'd open up the property code. Well, that won't work because of this. I'm like, What about this? He's like, Oh, that might work because of this. Yeah, dude, I, I probably paid for his time for two whole days. That was expensive. But we started to work through all that stuff and figure it out. And the more I learned, I kept seeing him go back to those books. Mm. And that's why I bought the books. But I probably spent 50 to 80 grand on legal fees, asking these guys, learning, and trying to figure it out. And once you start to figure it out, you can kind of understand how the codes work. And then- so Hernando's on here. I guess he has a title issue. He said he better get a, a one-year extension on his deal. <laughs> I would definitely do that. <laughs> what yeah. other books do you suggest besides the ones you have on your desk? You know, something that we deal with a lot is risk mitigation. And we're really risk, risk averse. As, as much as people look at this and they say, oh, my gosh, you're like, this is incredibly risky. I think this is how much risk I have. Like, I can't even measure it. I almost have no risk. But we understand what's going on. We understand how to, to manage and mitigate that risk. And um, 
so I would pick some stuff on risk management. Sam Zell just wrote a recent book that was really good. He's a he's a really risky guy, but he had some really great business principles. Um, I think that's another one I like was Never Split the Difference. That's a negotiating mm -hmm. book with uh, Gary Vee. Boss. Chris Chris, Chris, there you go. Yeah, yeah. That's a great negotiating book. Um, but I think you got to study risk management. That doesn't apply to negotiating dirty titles, but it, well, it does because you're measuring your risk and that helps us become better business owners. At the end of the day, we're doing like real estate deals, but I mean, it is a business, dude. I mean, you got a company, you got a business. And when you start doing a couple wholesale deals, it's a whole different thing than what you guys got here or what I got. Wow. Let's go ahead and start wrapping up. So let's maybe we can get some final golden nuggets from you. Uh, you yeah, you need, let's get the final golden nuggets. So stay tuned for the last final golden nuggets. Uh, real quick, guys, if you guys haven't done so yet, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Make sure you subscribe when you're there. If you haven't done so, please join the association on Facebook. Share that with your friends, other investors who would love tips, tricks, just like this, what Logan is sharing with you guys. Uh, that's on Facebook at Home Buying Home Selling Association. We're going to have a Lunch and Learn coming up, guys. The Lunch and Learn is on March 17th. Um, it's going to be buying real estate with creative financing. Come hang out with myself, Charles, the Home Buying Home Selling Solutions team. Uh, so we can, you guys can share, uh, we can share with you guys on how we're doing these creative deals, uh, multiple sub two deals, terms, all kinds of deals doing when it comes to apartments on how we're offering terms and being creative with the deal. Um, so you guys can definitely learn that. If you guys haven't heard so, we are, do have the Turn Up the Hustle Tour. It is a two day event with Charles and myself, the whole team, where you can tour the whole office, uh, scripts, dialogues, whatever you guys need to get to close your deal, we can definitely help you out. Uh, from SMS to um, multifamully to oh, call calls, call, 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 the boiler rooms, take it to a flip, take it to Airbnb, take it to our rentals, all that good stuff. How are we finding apartments? A two day tour. Uh, but enough of that. Last golden nuggets. What we got, Logan? So I know you saved the best. Flag. I know you got something. Hold on, let me think. I know you got something. Before he does that, uh -huh. let him plug his. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Plug yourself, man. So I'll tell you what we've been doing actually a lot lately. We've been in some classes. I saw uh, that. The yeah. stuff we're going through. I realize I get calls all the times and I just can't take the calls and do this, but I can spend eight hours putting together a rubric of this stuff. And we've got one on uh, development, navigating the city processes with platting, zoning, historic, how to subdivide lots, how to put them back together, how to repiece them. That's one of them also have uh, all of the ways in and out of a track contract, how to keep people in mm. it and how to get yourself out of it if you need to. Those are the two that I'm doing this year, one every couple months. I got room for about 20 people in the room. How can someone find you on Facebook or social media or find that class when you have it come um, up? I post a lot of that stuff on Facebook. So Logan Ful Logan Fulmer, you'll find me on Facebook. And then um, Asset yeah. Resolution Partners is our page there too. So he's tagged on this uh, description, guys. So go to his name and um, and do there. Yep. What else you got? The final couple golden nuggets when it comes to title um, issues. Like, uh, man, if I was a wholesaler just starting off, and what could I have as a title tip trick? Like, oh, I didn't know that. So many of them, huh? He's already dropped so many. He man. dropped so many. You, yeah. wanted, you wanted to get the whole Squeeze book. Squeeze the whole man. book. I'm out of Go gas. On, I'm out of gas. You know, you know what I, would, I would probably say it's not as complicated as you think it is, but people spend so much time trying to figure out every little detail. This is not a real estate business. This is a people business, and you're dealing in real estate. And I didn't know that until a little bit later on. It's people, man. So once I realized that, I stopped worrying about the details as much now that we focus on that a lot. But that's a small, at the end of the day, when I'm doing a deal, this is how much of people I'm dealing with. And this is how much of those laws and rules and experience I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with people, man. And for a few folks that are just trying to figure this stuff out, deal with a human. Go talk to them. Look them in the eye. Smile. And if you like them, tell them you like them. If you want to give them a hug, give them a hug. If you think they're crazy, well, tell them that. But be a human, dude. Deal with them. And I feel like that's probably the biggest thing that has changed our business the last couple of years. Can we stop looking at these people like a fucking vacant house? We're looking at them as a human, and they are, and we like it. Well, I know you got two classes that are coming up. You know, Mike and I, you know, we do a lot of stuff, you know, and uh, um, I look forward to uh, attending, you know, one or two of your classes. Of course, I know you're going to do two this year, maybe three. We'll do the same um, two a couple times. Yeah. Yep. Can I sneak in there or something? Yep. <laughs> but uh, no, man, it, I, I don't know what else to say, man. But we get a lot of people that come in here and they drop fire, they drop knowledge. But this is what we call getting into the weeds. So when Mike and I say, hey, man, we'll get in the weeds with you, I mean, you're you, you really in the weeds. 
We're living in the weeds, man. Low crawling, there. That's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, I'm gonna say he's low crawling like army style. You're really in the weeds, man. So, Jay, um, coming from Jason, you guys are the realest for interaction with these everybody. Shout out to everyone who's watching and, and asks these questions. I know this is a lot of feedback. Logan, again, Charles and I, and everyone who's watching, because I know you guys got tips, tricks, and maybe a deal popped into your head like, oh, I forgot about that one deal. Let me reach out to Logan. Definitely a pleasure to have you here, guys. Um, dropping all the knowledge that you did. True pleasure, right, Charles? Man, for us, because we love this stuff, you yeah. know, and, and, and yeah. of course, we know your work ethic, and we know your, your character, man. We just, it's a pleasure for us. Thank you. Uh, what we like to do with this podcast, you know, we, and we in, in our lunch and learns and stuff that we do, we want to drop real value, you know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. and, and not only that, I mean, we, not just giving it, sharing with people, but hey, man, if you're out there, and you got a deal, and you need help, and you know someone that can help you, for example, Logan here, you know what he does, ourselves, man, reach out, man. Yeah, please call me. Make it happen. It's better to get something out of, it's better to get something out of something than nothing. I, I think you guys are not stingy with your knowledge. I'm not stingy with my, stingy yeah. with my knowledge. I think folks are afraid sometimes to reach out. In this real estate community, mm. people do it more yeah. than a lot of others, but I encourage people, get on the phone with you guys. Get on the phone with me. Call and ask. The worst going to happen is we don't answer and we're too busy and don't call you back. But if you catch us when we're driving somewhere, you got 15 yeah, minutes. That's, that's you might get some good stuff, dude. I, I call when I'm driving. Call. Yeah. What I like, man, is sometimes we talk, you know, you know, we bounce off ideas off each other. Yeah. And that's really awesome, man. I appreciate you a lot, man. Right well, Logan, again, greatly appreciate it. If you guys missed it, because I know people keep tuning in throughout the whole podcast, you can go back to our YouTube uh, channel and find this podcast. So you can go at the Home Bottom Selling Solutions Facebook page where Logan has just dropped tons and tons and tons of knowledge of how to do these crazy, dirty title issues, multiple heirs, going to court, landlocking deals, adding a road, making six figures, going back to the 1700s, uh, just all kinds of crazy stuff. You guys, <laughs> you know, that's how you know it's a, a true uh, podcast on title. So, again, Logan, our, our pleasure to have you on here. Uh, it's a great show. Any last words before we sign off? You know, before we sign off here, man, we always say one thing. And we always that, say one thing. And, and that one thing is... <laughs> Logan I, I wanted to say Logan knows I'm down to the cough and drop you know what I'm saying but he says that don't sound good so we're gonna say turn off the hustle yeah. so turn off the hustle turn like, the hustle. so turn off the hustle guys that's something with your, your first deal uh, where you're trying to do your first deal or you've already done your first deal and you're trying to do maybe two or three deals a month if you're trying to learn about tax issues you're trying to do something different we always like to say turn up the hustle where you want to do something on your end on, turn man. up your hustle turn up our hustle can you get Logan a hustle hat man do you mind if we have any yeah do we have a shirt uh, yes. I know we're out of shirts um, we're going to get you a hustle hat, we'll get you a hustle because this you, guy you've taken hustle to a whole other level man. <laughs> this guy really turns yeah. up the hustle when it comes to title issues so um, hey man your team man I mean uh, you know and congratulations on, on, on you know you baby right that's right and five and, and a half months you and your wife right so, that's right so, yeah. so. That's we have awesome. a house full. It's me, her, nine, seven, and five months. And your wife's a realtor too, right? That's right. She's a realtor too. You yeah. want to plug her real quick? So, Lisette Fulmer, um, she does some residential stuff. She does some commercial stuff. She works predominantly with us, but we do help some third-party listings sometimes. Um, dude, I love it. Thank you. I'm going to wear it tomorrow. I'm going to put some pictures off of you guys. There you go. All right. But, yeah, she's a great gal, man. When I met her, I, I was, you know, like, immediately I knew, man, this is, like, the best person ever. And I just... I don't know, man. And I was Every day since, and I wake up, and I'm like, holy cow, I get to be married to this girl? I, I was, uh, I know we're running in short on time, but I told you the other day when I saw you, you guys had like a little, like a love story online, <laughs> and and it's pretty awesome to Thanks. watch that, you know. If you guys need a realtor, we have agents here, but again, you know, if you need a realtor, your wife, she's, uh, she's a good person, and uh, she'll take care of them, so, you know. I appreciate that. All right, well, with that being said, man, we appreciate that you turn up the hustle. So remember, guys, turn up the hustle in yourself and your business. Um, one last final golden buzzer for you because that was for the overall. And with that being said, guys, here at Home Bottom Sun Solutions, we always make sure that we turn up, turn up, up the, the hustle. hustle.